so one of the uh, one of the things that when I was younger that I, I, and I don't think anyone ever taught me this because it would be a weird thing to teach, but one of the things that I thought was that people from a long time ago must have been very different from me. They, you know, there must have been some different quality of their humanness than mine. You know, it's the same problem we run into uh, when we're reading about scripture. We'll talk about that in a second. But, you know, this, this sense of people from a long time ago, even though their lives were so different, there must be nothing that can relate or connect or make sense. And then I run into stories like this, story where uh, they are finding uh, scrolls, finding uh, lim- illuminated manuscripts. These monks who have dedicated their lives to God, and their particular task is before the printing press writing out different uh, you know writing out different copies of the Bible so that they can be spread and sent out and what they have found in some of these manuscripts are cat doodles on the side they've found complaints about their boss and they found uh, they found places where they've uh, where they have drawn things that have been based on you know you have to draw a big fancy in or whatever, and they've drawn other stuff based on that that has uh, that's that's sort of uh, made it a little more off color. There you find these sorts of things in these illuminated manuscripts, and then you go back and, and a few a uh, few months ago I talked about one of the earliest documents we ever found was basically the equivalent of a Yelp complaint of uh, like this guy you know refused to give me the order that I sent and you know with that sort of thing and you you get enough of those and you start to realize okay people are people no matter what country they get born into no matter what time they have people tend to be people and so you see that in all kinds of ways so as we enter into our new sermon series this week we are going to be jumping into a time and a place and and an area that uh, we may not be as familiar with, but the idea here, and what I want you, the lens that I want you to use, is this lens of seeing where am I in this, and where do you see God working in this that is the same that you could see God working in our world, in my life, in our church. We're going to be looking at the book of Ruth. Now, the Old Testament book of Ruth comes uh, right after the... Um, right after the book of Judges. So you have the first five books of the Old Testament, uh, and then, which is the Torah, the main main sort of function of Jewish law. And then you have Joshua, and Joshua explains how, you know, they fit the battle of Jericho, right? And they went into the promised land, and, and there were all sorts of issues and problems that came up with that, but Joshua's life ends on this high note, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, that sort of thing. Then you get to the book of Judges, and Judges is where the wheels really fall off. And uh, because what happens is the people of Israel decide to do their own thing. They get in real trouble and they go, God, I need your help. And God raises up a leader called a judge who delivers them. That judge dies and then the people forget. They get into trouble. They get in a real situation. They call God. God, I need your help. God raises up a judge. We do this over and over and over for about 20 chapters, and it eventually ends, as all these sorts of things do, where they eventually quit calling to God, and things just sort of unravel. We enter then into the book of Ruth. And this is a radically different book, where in the book of Judges, the book of Judges ends with horrific violence, specifically violence against women, because in this culture, in this time, women were property. Their value and their worth was their ability to have kids. Nope, not kids, their ability to have sons. If you didn't have sons, you were worth nothing. In fact, you were worth less than nothing because you were a drain on resources. And yet, in the midst of this understanding and culture, the very next book of the Bible is a book called Ruth, which should be your first clue that something different is going to be happening here. So, if you would, would you turn, you can either find uh, your, the Bible that you brought with you, or there should be a Bible underneath your seat or the seat in front of you, and you're invited to turn in the Old Testament to the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth, chapter 1. Thank you. 
And we are going to slowly walk through this chapter together. So, Ruth, chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem, Bethlehem, uh, as you may or may not know, means house of bread, so there's double irony here that there is a famine in the house of bread, in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Okay, here's the first record scratch for people who understand what's going on here. Moab are the enemy. Moab is a country that is despised and hated. They have had wars fought back and forth. Moab are the people who you don't like and you are raised not to like. They worship a different God. They believe different things. They are out to destroy you. And yet, this guy, his wife, their sons go and live there. Their need and their desperation is so great that they are willing to go to a foreign country where they have no rights, no expectations, just for the chance that they could live. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. Now, the, first, the next clue here that something weird is happening is that men are never put in the possession of women. But you see what just happened here? Elimel Naomi is not Elimelech's wife. Elimelech is Naomi's husband. And this is all we know about poor Elimelech. He is now taken off the scene. Bye, Elimelech. Thanks for coming. So, but, see, Naomi's still good. Because Naomi has her two sons, and her two sons give her protection, give her worth, give her value. She was left with her two sons. Verse 4, they married Moabite women. Er, scratch number two on the record. This is not what you do or how you do it, but here in this foreign land, among these foreign people that are the enemy, they have now intermarried. They married one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion, the two boys, also died. Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. So this is Naomi's situation at this point. Naomi is as good as dead. Naomi can't work. Naomi's, Naomi's responsibility now, Naomi's hope now, is to basically hope she can beg for food in order to meagerly so, you know, just stay alive. And that's all that's left for her. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, and imagine, if you will, Naomi's situation. Naomi lives here in Bethlehem. There's no food here. So she and her family move over here to Moab. While she's here, her husband dies, and her two sons die. Where is God in the midst of that? I'll tell you where God is, putting food back over there. How do you think Naomi... Where do you think Naomi's head's at right here, right? How do you think Naomi's feeling? How do you think Naomi deals with being broken wide open in every possible way. And not only does it not seem like God's answering, it seems like God is purposely making it harder on her. Naomi and her two daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. When her two, with her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness, hold on to that word, to you, as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Now, they still have a responsibility to Naomi, okay? They, when Naomi says, hey, we're moving home, Orpah and Ruth go, okay, we're moving back. But it's not home for them. Because they will be heading to a country where they will be the foreigner and the alien. They are moving to a country where after 10 years with their husbands, they weren't able to have kids either. So there is question about what sort of, in this culture, what sort of worth and value do they have as well? They are widowed foreigners who are barren. What are they going to do? Naomi 
as they are on the way, goes, I can't do this to you. And Naomi, even though it's going to make Naomi's life harder, because Naomi, if all three of them are in the same situation, then all three of them can be begging for food. All three of them can be finding hope in some way. But Naomi sees the two of them and knows that if they head back to Judah, they have no hope. So Naomi says, I release you. Go and find home in some other, with some other husband. Make, find some way that you can be safe and have hope in your life. This is unbelievably self-sacrificing love. This is the kind of love that looks at the other person and says, even though it's going to hurt me, your needs are more important than mine, and I want to take care of you. That word that I had you hold on to, that word kindness right there, that word isn't really kindness, right? Because kindness is, you know, getting the puppy out of the road, Right? Kindness is good. Kindness is meaningful. Kindness is needed. But this is more than kindness. The Hebrew word here is hesed, which is just the best sort of Hebrew kind of word. And hesed, uh, hesed means about 37 different things, like all Hebrew words mean. But the best way that you can understand hesed is self-sacrificing love. See, that's more and bigger than kindness, right? I can be kind to you, but you haven't really affected me. Like, I, look, I'm going to be nice. Everything's good. Hi, how you doing, Karen? Everything good? All right. So I'm kind. See, I'm nice. But hesed means I am giving of myself. I am sacrificing in some way that is going to hurt more, more than inconvenience, right? We won't even do things that inconvenience us. This is something that will hurt and possibly cause problems for me, significant problems, but I choose to do it anyway because I love you so much that taking care of you is worth that level of care. That's what Hesed is. Naomi says, I can't show you Hesed. I can't, I can't protect you and care for you. So the only thing I can do is show you Hesed love. I can show you self-sacrificing love so that I put your needs ahead of my own and care for you and, and you can go and find a home. This is unbelievable. This is amazing. This is godly sort of level stuff. And she's ordering her daughters-in-law to do this this. All right. She says, go home. She kissed them and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. No, no, no. Let us show that same love to you. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons? Who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. Then at this they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Now we're going to be very careful right here from the start because right here from the start, the book's obviously named Ruth. So we know who our hero is, right? Yay, Ruth. But that means that we're looking for somebody who's the bad guy and it's easy to go Orpah, you're the bad guy, but Orpah's not the bad guy here, right? Orpah makes the sensible, smart choice and by and by Orpah obeys her mother-in-law which all mother-in-laws out here would think is a very wise and smart thing to do, right? <laughs> Orpah obeys her mother-in-law who says, go home, find a hope and a future for you. And Orpah, weeping, does what Naomi asks. But Ruth clung to her. <clears throat> Fifteen. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Ruth is making a... a conversion here to the God of Israel and saying that I am with you and identify with you completely. Wherever, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you from me. 
When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So here's the scene. Orpah goes off. Bye, Orpah. Okay, so then Ruth, and Ruth's still there. So Naomi goes, look, Orpah's gone. Why, you need to go too. This is the sensible thing. Let me hesed you. Let me self-sacrifice so that you can have a future. And Ruth says, no dice. No way. Where you go, I will go. Where you be, I, where you are, I will be. Where you die, I will die. Ruth isn't going because she thinks it's going to be a super fun road trip and adventure. Ruth is going because she knows the only hope Naomi has, the only hope of any possible future at all, is if Ruth goes with her. But even with that hope, there's probably not much hope at all. Where you die, I will die. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. And then she lays a she she puts a curse on herself in the name of Israel's God. May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I ever break my word. She clung to Naomi. As Naomi is trying to offer self-sacrificing Hesed love, Ruth shows her that same love back and goes, No, I am with you. We are here together. And uh, she says, you know, wherever you go, I will go. And, and you, we are so inundated with sort of surface level -y kind of stuff, surface level -y kind of, of love. You know, the, the, I intentionally titled the sermon, Wherever You Go, so that Richard Marks is singing in your head right now. The, wherever you go, come on. Oh, people, come on. <laughs> right here waiting for you. Whatever it takes, or how my heart breaks, I will be right here waiting for you. You're all going to come up and sing to me afterwards, and I'm going to shame you for not singing right now, so just be aware. <laughs> I knew that song too. I know, you didn't say anything though. So... <laughs> Because that's what we think of. We think of this sort of synthesizery, big, over-the-top, melodramatic teenage, I love you and I love you forever. But this is real life. This is adult-level kind of stuff that Ruth is saying. Ruth isn't saying, look, it's going to be great. Whatever happens, it'll be fine. Ruth is saying, I know that I'm probably signing my death warrant. I know that this will, this will cost me and require more of me, but I love you so much that I will hesed love this, that I will sacrifice myself so that you have a hope and a future. That's what Ruth does. That's what we find in Ruth 1, and that's why this sort of story written and told over and over thousands of years ago and told and repeated throughout the ages continues to resonate as if it was something I made up right now. In that this is very human and this is very real, but it is not something that we can empower and do fully on our own. This is God type of stuff. This is how, this, this sort of connection, this sort of love, this sort of self-sacrifice is what comes from the way that God loves. And we, with the benefit of all of the Old Testament and then all of the New Testament, can speak to and say, this is exactly the way that God loves, that we see in the life of Jesus. That we see in the life of Jesus, one who refuse to take the easy way out, step after step after step after step, even to the point of accepting death on the cross as if he were some scandalized, low-level criminal. He did that because his love for us, God's love for us, is so overwhelming and so great that he was willing to hesed love, to sacrifice himself so that we could have a hope, so that we could have a future, so that we could be cared for. Ruth clings to Naomi. Ruth shows this kind of hesed love. What, and, and that is the echo that we see fulfilled in what Jesus does on the cross and the empty tomb. His self-sacrificing, his giving of his life, taking on our sins, allows us the opportunity to live forever. But 
what God calls us to, what Jesus speaks to, is that it's not just so that we can have it really well and high-five each other and enjoy life. It's so that we can take up our own cross, so that we can be the kind of people who are filled with this Hesed type of love in our world. You don't have to spend much time around people, either online or in person, to see that uh, we are just swimming in selfishness right now, right? We, all we care about is how it affects us. In fact, just go drive on College Parkway, right? Like, you can see all kinds. Um, And hopefully it's not you that's doing it. But we are swimming in selfishness. What matters is that I get what I want and I need. The message of Jesus forever, but the message of Jesus, especially through the lens of Ruth, is self-sacrificing love. Who is it that you are sacrificing for? Who is it that you are making, more than an inconvenience, a sacrifice in your life so that other people can know and experience love and grace and goodness? Where are you showing hesed? And where have others shown hesed to you? This is God's call. If you are a Christian, this is God's call to you. How are you taking up your cross? Not, oh, I'm going to suffer by parking in the last spot of the the lot so other people can have earlier spots. No, no, no. How are you suffering and sacrificing so that others can come to know God? How are you sacrificing and suffering so that others in your world can experience love and hope and goodness? What are you doing so that you are carrying out this type of Hesed love that Jesus calls us to and Ruth models? Where you go and what you do, how are you giving of yourself so that God can be glorified, so that Christ can be known, and so that we can subversively and counterculturally say to our, this overwhelming tidal wave of selfishness, no, I choose to give of myself. I choose to serve, and I choose to love because this is what God has done for me. Hesed, like selfishness, also becomes contagious. As you see other people give and serve, there is the spirit sort of wakes up in you, and you go, what, what am I called to do? So as we hear of Ruth basically sacrificing her own life, her own future, her own hopes so that Naomi has a chance. Where are you, and how are you pouring out hesed to those around you? How are you showing this type of self-sacrificing love, and how are you giving up so that others may have what they need, so that others may experience Christ's love, so that we can stand up against the selfishness of our world and say, no, there is a better way. There is a deeper way. There is a Christ-centered way, and it's called Hesed. Would you pray with me? God, we know that we can only serve and give this type of love through your power and your spirit. So we invite you in, God. Show us those places where we have been selfish, where the the sins that we have committed and those things that we have left undone that we should have done. Show us, God, how we are called to serve and to give and to love. Bring people into our world so that we can give of ourselves just as you gave for us. We love you, God, and we thank you. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.